the topic of this uh, conversation is over the weekend, there was an article, or was an interview with Jordan Peterson in the Sunday Times magazine by a journalist called Decker Aitkenhead. It, w- it was titled A Broken Man and was there was a response from Jordan Peterson yesterday where he talked about uh, he talked about it in terms of cru- what did he say cruelty and betrayal, and he put forward the the initial email that the editor had sent, and obviously felt very very hurt by the what the cover by the coverage, uh, in particular the treatment of of his illness and of Michaela his daughter, and. Tim and I have obviously covered Jordan Peterson quite a lot. Tim was the first journalist to cover Jordan Peterson for a mainstream publication in the UK in about 2017, at around the same time that I put out the first documentary with him, or a little bit before, I think. Um, Tim wrote his piece for The Spectator. And so I thought it would be really, Tim and I would sort of converse about this once the once the article was written and we we both read the response and we both kind of covered this for quite a while and i think yeah we wanted to sort of have a conversation about maybe the journalistic ethics involved what we make of it and some of the deeper questions because this if people have been following jordan peterson for a while this isn't the first time this has happened and it I've heard from quite a lot of people that they they have been one of the things that has made them kind of critical of the media or been aware of a lot of the biases of the media is seeing the difference between their treatment of people like Jordan Peterson and then what they made of him when they actually sort of started listening to his lectures and encountered his work and dived into it themselves. Um, I also want to say that I think there are valid criticisms as well. And I think there are valid questions as well that we'll hopefully get into. It's not going to be sort of a just just a full on um, defense and saying what an outrage it was. But but I think we'll get to that later in, in the call. Tim, do you want to start by saying what you what you made of it initially? Because um, I think we both had a reaction to the piece. And then Jordan released the the interview on his channel and then released the statement yesterday which kind of put a little bit of a different spin on the on the article. It'd be good to get a sense if, if everyone here has, has read the article and also has seen the piece. I don't think we'll be able to recap the whole thing, but I'm seeing quite a few nods um, there. Okay, great. Tim, what did you, do you want to sort of start by saying what you made of it and, and, and what you sort of have made of it since? When I first read it, I, didn't feel so much angry with the journalist, Decca Aikenhead, who I know a little bit. Um, I felt very sad. Um, you know, I took, as it were, her at her word. Um, and the impression I got was, was of, as the cover line on the magazine said, of a broken man who seemed to be under the, or in the thrall of his daughter and her Russian boyfriend. Um, And uh, the the journalist often used, or several times used the word blank to refer to Peterson. He answers things blankly or he says something in a blank way. And one sort of rather got the impression that he'd become a bit of a zombie. And... um, I certainly, who was kind of being run by a Svengali figure, i.e. his daughter. Um, And uh, although, you know, I think that the article contained really the usual slew of misrepresentations, um, such as the fact that he was a gateway to the all right or that he's, uh, you know, all about telling men to suck it up or that he thinks women are chaos. I mean, all this nonsense it was there, but, you know, not necessarily as, 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 as upfront as it often is in um, interviews with him. But, uh, you know, I thought, oh, dear, you know, he's been through hell in the last couple of years. 
and it's clearly caused him great damage and the um and the drugs he's been taking seem to have caused him great damage um so i felt sad uh but then i um listened to the transcript of the interview that jordan peterson posted at this point i became angry frankly um I, I mean, I, I spent many years as a journalist uh, doing these kind of interviews, so I kind of know the form. Um, and I think we're all, if I'm speaking to myself as a journalist, we're all guilty to some extent of misrepresentation because we're looking for an angle or a, or a, a line to take. But this went way beyond anything I'd come across before, certainly in a so-called respectable newspaper like the times i mean in fact jordan peterson was extremely articulate perhaps you know as far as i was concerned well i don't know if he's back to his old self but he certainly didn't sound like the person that he'd been betrayed or but as in the article the article portrayed a situation where his daughter was constantly standing over him telling him what to say and do and think almost, which wasn't the case in the slightest. Uh, and by the end of it, and once I'd thought about it, I was, I was, I was really shocked. I was really shocked. And I, I've, I've done something I never do, which I, I've written to the editor of the magazine. I've written to Decca herself. I've written to the managing editor of the time, so I know. Um, just expressing my dismay that it's come to this. Um, and, and, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll finish in a minute because I don't want to take up all the space, but, you know, the more I think about it, the, the, the more I, I feel once again that it's not even, not even malice beyond the normal bounds of journalistic malice, which is very much a way of getting attention when you're a journalist. I, I've done it myself, to my shame, I would say, but when I was much younger. It, but it, it seems more to me what David, I think, originally described as the glitch in the matrix, is there's a complete misunderstanding here. There's a, and not only a misunderstanding, but an absolute determination not to understand what this man is and, and what he's trying to say. Um, oh, of course, avowedly, the interview wasn't meant to be about who he was and what he was trying to say. It was meant to be about his health, uh, as I understand it. He, that was the brief. Um, and had it just been about his health, then I think it would have been, notwithstanding the many distortions within that, that would have been fair enough, but of course it, it wasn't. And the idea was that somehow his so-called propensity for telling men to man up, which as far as I'm concerned is not at all what he says, um, had rebounded on him and caused him to have essentially a schizophrenic breakdown. And I did use the word schizophrenia in the article. Um, now, I can't speak as to his health or its, its causes, the causes of his ill health. And I did find the whole journey he's been on peculiar, hard to understand, uh, and open to a lot of questioning. I certainly think that he's probably... Well, one is, le one is left to suspect as one possibility that he has been has not been able to cope psychologically with the pressure that was on him, um, which would be a perfectly reasonable response from any human being, given having met him three times now. He's a, he, he's a genuinely sensitive man. You know, he's not this alt-right thug. I mean, it is just nonsense. And I genuinely feel sorry for the guy, which also informed my response because I, I think he's been through such a terrible time. And I think that really shocked me with, the, with, with when I read the interview 
and realized and came to understand the level of malice in it. Um, but finally, it, you know, it's, it, I don't, as I said at the beginning of this, I'm not even sure it's about malice, except the normal reflexive journalistic malice in this case. It's more a case of just utter incomprehension. And, and the reason it, I think it, it, it repels so many people, particularly who've, who have think in a certain, shall we say, modern left vernacular, is his, is his concentration on personal responsibility. And I think that's what throws the spanner into the works for so many commentators who might otherwise be sympathetic towards him. Because it seems to me the left don't really have a language for personal responsibility anymore. They did once. Um, and, uh, and now the focus is always on groups. But individual responsibility which is a much more complicated and challenging idea, seems to threaten people. So that's my take on it, David, as far as I, I've got so far. Mm. Yeah, and there's a few pieces there to come back to. Uh, two, two quick things I wanted to cover that you brought up, because I think the, the thing that, one of the things that uh, seems to have been most upsetting was this sort of seizing on the schizophrenia point, which if you listen to the conversation, they're saying his symptoms were so bad that some of the doctors even, or one doctor, I think, even suspected that it, would, that it was schizophrenia, which was obviously ridiculous because, of, because it, it, um, doesn't, it doesn't kind of afflict people at his, at his age with no previous symptoms. Um, and it was clearly the, the drugs. And it was said in a very... And for that to be sort of taken up and the, 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 the line to be he was diagnosed with schizophrenia is just clearly, it's clearly misrepresentation. You can just about get away with saying that, but it's really stretching the truth. And it seems to, like that, that's one of the pieces that people seem to have, have, have said is really unfair. The other piece was the, the sort of almost like very casual invocation of toxic masculinity which the irony there which and I think this points to a lot of the catch-22 situation that that I've noticed with the with the men's work that that I, I've done and the whole dynamic and the whole conversation around masculinity is could you imagine this kind of treatment of if Jordan Peterson had been a woman like could you imagine an article that said a broken woman and had gone in, like in, in the aftermath of what had happened to, to him over that period, I, I can't imagine that being the case. I just don't think that, that, that any newspaper or any um, media organization would run that. I think that, that somehow, and this is the catch-22 that I've seen so much in our men's retreats, is men being told to be more honest, to be more emotionally open, to be more vulnerable, which... Jordan Peterson has has been very emotionally vulnerable. He's he cries a lot. He talks about his like he wears his emotions on his on his sleeve, and to be kind of attacked for that. Like I see this catch twenty two so much to basically say, men, you need to be more vulnerable, more more honest, more emotional, and then when they are to be attacked for that. No, you're taking up too much space. Like that that is such a that is such a paradox. And I, I think the sort of the, the pointing to that toxic masculinity just to me highlights these kind of double standards that we have in the culture around that. Um, yes. And on, on, to pick up on that momentarily, David, mm. I think there were, it's a very long thread on after the article on the times um, universally pretty much attacking Deck Rake and head in the times for running it. Um, but uh, it's one, a few of the people talked about toxic femininity. Um, now, I don't have a view on toxic femininity. I don't know if it exists and, and I, you know, I, no, I don't have a view. But I do think it's interesting, the idea that 
if, it, as you said, it would have been unthinkable if Jordan Peterson had been a woman to be treated in such a callous fashion. Similarly, I don't think if Decker Aiton could have been a man that she could have got away with calling his daughter um, a pouting Barbie blonde, for instance. You know, I think that sort of thing would be entirely beyond the pale. So there's very clearly several things going on. Um, one is a kind of denial. One is a kind of um, double standard. A third is a kind of journalistic practice, which, which I'm not familiar with, but have only really come to understand lately, which is what, I don't know to what extent this was preconceived as, a, and even now will be conceived in the Times editorial offices and by Decker herself, despite the massively negative response as a positive thing. Um, because it's been clickbait. And these things thrive now on controversy. And she may have well set out to think, well, how do I get this thing the maximum uh, profile? Um, and, uh, you know, th 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 that, that I think is a very sinister development. And I think it's taken over the, what was once the quality press in the way that once that was the preserve of the gutter press, people like the Mail and the Sun quite nakedly paraded their prejudices and, and, and interweaved opinion with, with news and, and certainly their features. But I think outlets like the Times and the Observer and the Guardian were always while hardly innocent, were, were much more careful about that and certainly had writers who, were, who would go out of their way to present a balanced fixture of a picture of a person, however controversial they happen to be, and make an attempt to understand that person a bit more comprehensively. Mm. And, and that's really what I found depressing because it's it's not this it's this isn't a one-off is it i mean it, it's um it's it's a trend it's a it's a it's a tendency it's the it's it's a corruption of of mainstream media yeah and it's interesting in the the statement that he put out afterwards that he he talks about that he talks about the the interview with Kathy Newman and the interview with Helen Lewis, like he, he, he basically says his strategy so far has been just to speak the truth as best as he can and let the chips fall as they may. Um, I would still say that there, I, there was a real difference in his demeanor in those two interviews in the, the Kathy Newman one, which felt like a kind of, um, there was a layer of like, it was, it was combative, but there was also a layer of sort of almost, um, good humour below that that he certainly demonstrated and the, and, the, and the one with Helen Lewis was very, very different and I think he was in a very different place at that point. But what's really interesting as an, as an observer, there was a time where Jordan took on uh, CAA, who are a big agency in um, California, and a lot of people said, oh, he's, he's now got media handlers, he's being controlled, or he's, he's got this sort of... Um, he's got this... Um, infrastructure around him and the striking thing is how little of that he has had from the beginning as someone with his level of celebrity to to engage with the media in the way that he has is very unusual and to engage not just with the media the the there was that big scandal with the the photograph that was taken off him in in New Zealand with the guy with the Islamophobia t-shirts like that would never, like, if, if he did have media handlers, if CAA were treating him like they would treat sort of a celebrity, a pop star or someone like that, that would not happen. Like, that the, the, that happened and, and seemed to happen on a fairly regular basis um, kind of speaks to his strategy 
for want of a better word, but also I think a sense of deliberate. And I, I'd go back actually, the, the other article was the, the one in the New York Times, The Custodian of the Patriarchy, where that journalist, um, Nellie Bowles, had actually approached other people. I know she'd approached Eric Weinstein, Brett Weinstein before, and they'd talked to her off the record and had basically come to the conclusion that she was going to frame them as being men's rights activists and had a, an agenda and decided not to talk to her. And and Jordan pretty much invited her into his home for three days. And then what came from that was quite a, was a was certainly a very angled piece, if not an outright hit piece. And that's been striking. And I don't know whether it's incredibly admirable or it's incredibly naive or it's or it's both. I'd be interested as someone, like I've worked in in the media, I've worked in newsrooms, but I haven't done like feature interviews, profiles in the way that you have. So I'd be interested if you've got any thoughts about what that process involves and whether you think that, yeah, do you think that's naivety or do you think that's um, sticking to your guns and allowing the, the media to expose itself for what it, for the games that it plays? I like to think that it's idealism. You know, I think he's, he's, he's passionate about this idea of standing on what he thinks and what he believes. And it's also naive because I think, here's a good analogy that I, um, someone once described to me, which is that if you go on television without any makeup, you don't look real. Um, and you kind of need a bit of makeup to bring out your natural contours. And that's a lesson he might well, without giving up any of his integrity, do well to consider. I mean, I think when you're as smart as Jordan says, um, I, I hesitate to use the word arrogant, um, because I don't think he is arrogant, um, actually, but he knows how clever he is. And I think, um, I think he's determined to do things his way. And I sort of, I do admire the fact that he's not got some oily media manager, you know, keeping away from anybody who might portray him in a bad light. Um, and that's pretty admirable. But at the same time, you know, he's, he's serving up nice juicy meals to those who are hungry for him, you know? And if, if, I, if I were him, I'd certainly give that some consideration um, and, and, and be realistic, you know? And I don't think that necessarily leads to him selling himself out, uh, which I think he probably, I think he probably does because I, 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 I sense that he's a, you know, in a sense, a truth extremist you know he's he's passionate about the truth and he hates the idea of having it trimmed tailored to meet the audience and i admire that but he's suffering the consequences and he's suffering the consequences this weekend you know and and i guess he would say since he believes in personal responsibility and I was struck by, although he was upset, there was a lack of bitterness in his messaging after the interview, that, you know, he has to take responsibility for doing something that I could have told him, <laughs> had he bothered to ask, was probably not a very good idea. You know, I mean, I, I, mean, I, just, I just think, have a think about it, you know, or just, and he, he does seem sort of almost naively trusting sometimes. Would you have advised him not to do the interview with the Sunday Times? I mean, you saw the the email that was sent. You saw the way that it was framed. Um, I mean, we both. I, I don't know Decker. You you know Decker, but not she's, very well. She's sort of, I mean, she's she's certainly got a pretty um, stellar reputation as an interviewer. Well, if I were him, I would I would have offered a Q and A. 
you know, that's to me the best compromise position. And of course, they can edit a Q and A, but it's still a Q and A. You know, in other words, a transcript without all the sort of filling, all the ideological filling. And then you can say, all right, well, obviously they've, you know, they've cut and pasted this a bit, but you can go and have a look at the whole interview if you want. You don't get all this very sly, these very sly stilettos in between the ribs. So that would be my compromise solution is, yeah, I'll talk to you, but A, I'm going to record it as he did, and I'm going to post it as he did um, and afterwards. Um, and furthermore, you have to do it as a Q&A. And I think that is the best defence you have, though it's not a 100% one, to this kind of assassination. Yeah, and I think it's worth covering a little bit more of the context because the, the the statement that he released yesterday was kind of classically self-reflective. I mean, one of the things I think um, those of us who've been impressed with um, his sort of public persona have seen him constantly wrestle with what it means and what is going on and how he's been treated and what he should do with it. And there was a lot there that was really, um, I copied and copied and pasted a little bit here. Um, what did he say? I hope to be judicious in my decisions about when and where to speak. I hope that I can stick to the truth when I do so and believe there is no better defense and indeed no better offense than that. Do I trust myself to tell the truth? Will my ego invariably get in the way? Has that already happened? Um, that's, it, it's really interesting. Um, and the, he also, the reason that he did that interview about his health was that he wanted to clear the, the slate before the, the, the run of interviews that he would, was going to be doing about his book coming up. So he kind of thought, like there was a media strategy there of, I'm going to have to address the health questions, but if I can address them in a high-profile way, maybe they, we can move the story on, and then the the next set of interviews can be about the book rather than about the health issues, um, which I think I think is a little. I, I don't think that's likely to happen because I think just the way that the the, the way that the the news agenda is, I think that the health issues are going to be the centerpiece of any interview for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. they're going to pick up on this, you know. Um, I mean, to be fair to Jordan in this case, as I understand it, this is what he was advised to do mm. um, by, by Penguin. Um, so, you know, he, the, I think he says this himself on the, in, in, in his posting. Um, he listened to the advice of the experts. Um, some of whom I know, I know. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it was great advice. You know, I, I think it was. I think it was. You know, if I, again, if you were asking me, and I'm not a PR, I'd have said, you know, yeah, you can talk for ten minutes about my health, and we have to get on to other stuff. And I'm not going to talk about my health beyond. You know, that's common practice certainly for your average movie mm. celebrity, you know, they'll, they'll lay out the ground of what they're prepared to talk to and, and what they're not. And I do think it was not that sensible of him, though maybe he had no choice or not no choice, but maybe he felt it was unwise. But I don't think it was a good look having, um, having Michaela floating mm. about. Yeah, I mean, that was something that from the initial article in particular, I mean, you'll, you'll know this, like the, the last thing or the thing that will wind up a journalist more than anything else is the sense of having a PR in the room. Like, and you know that if you're asked to talk about this or not to talk about this, or you sense that they're sort of hovering or wanting to get involved, there is nothing more likely to, to make a journalist to upset a journalist and make and to make them sort of pursue a certain line of questioning than being told that you can't. Yeah. But 
And that was the impression that I got from the initial article. But then when when you actually listen to the to the conversation, yeah, Michaela does interrupt a couple of times, but it's certainly not overbearing in the way that it comes across in the article. I think you're right. I think I think being in there in the first place is a bad look because it triggers a lot of um, yeah, it figures a lot of the radar of a of a of a kind of of a reporter to kind of go against whatever they're, they're being advised to do with the PR. What did you make of that? Would you have the same reaction to 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 basically having a PR in the room? Yeah, something similar. I mean, a protector, you know, someone who's like going to watch out in case they say anything that goes against. You know, it's really the opposite of, of the sort of thing that. Jordan stands for him. My God, I think he can look after himself. I mean, he's, I'm sure he's got his reasons. Um, you know, but I think, again, that might somewhat come down to a naivety and not uh, fully understand how the media think about these things. Uh, and also, you know, the, and also he was naive about how, how easily the construction of a narrative if he'd have been a bit more cynical, and perhaps he's insufficiently cynical, um, you know, to bring in Michaela and her Russian husband, and we all know what the popular view of Russian Russian men is. I'm sure he's nothing like that, but I mean, but the fact is that you know, the moment you think of Russian husband and going to all these sort of strange places in Eastern Europe. You think you you think well something dodgy is going on, um, so all that was was detracting from him. I think, mm. and I, you know I, I don't want to be I, I'm really not intending to be rude to Michaela in any way. I'm sure, she's a very nice person and, and very well meaning, and, and herself has suffered horribly. But I don't. I'm not interested in what she's got to say. I mean, who is she? I, I got, I got absolutely no interest in her, you know, as a thinker, or as, you know, I've got an interest in her as a human being. I, I have sympathy with her as a human being, but I just don't know what she's doing in the room, you know. And, and I'd, I, I, you know, and be given essentially half the space of that article. It makes you think, you know, it dilutes. The central, the centrality of Jordan, who's clearly a very loving father and devoted to his daughter, and why wouldn't he be given how much she supported him? Um, but I think she very much needs not to get carried away, and I think he should not let her get carried away. Yeah, I mean the the structure of the release transcript showed that. There was a conversation with with Jordan, and then there was a conversation with Michaela that she had with Decker, basically because she felt that when Jordan talks about his illness, it puts him into a into a bad space for a couple of days afterwards. I mean, my concern, I guess, with that is that it's difficult to see how they won't become more, far more guarded with with stuff like maybe they're blaming themselves for for mentioning the schizophrenia thing and having that taken out of context, and then. If you start second guessing that anything that you say and all of the medical details that you give might be taken out of context and might be misrepresented, that it'll just lead to a sort of cycle of increased defensiveness and increased, um, yeah, re retreat. Which, oh, sorry to interrupt you, David. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 one shouldn't forget that Jordan is an academic, you know, and therefore what he deals in his detail and he thinks I sometimes imagine that if you just give people enough facts and detail that they're going to be better informed um, and that's really not the way the media wor world works what happens when you give them a lot of facts and detail whether reliable or unreliable is they get bored um, and you know move on to something else having formed a having formed a, 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 a stereotypical position. So, you know, he's got a great faith in reason, I think. And that, you know, even though I think from my, as far as I can see, the, the medical treatment 
was not always based in reason. I don't know. I don't know. That's a real mystery to me. I mean, it remains a mystery at the end of the story. What the hell was going on there? I mean, I, you know, I don't, I mean, without getting into the content, uh, I believe it is your view, David, that, you know, and I'm, I'm tempted to agree that, you know, the poor man was much more afflicted by a kind of physical nervous breakdown, physically expressed nervous breakdown than, than autoimmune disease. But I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. But, it, you know, it, it seemed a bit crazy. Mm. Yeah, I think this would be a good time to just... Uh, add in a little bit more context before we go to the Q&A, which is that there were lots of valid questions, like lots of the, the things that were asked in the interview are really valid questions, like the, the medical history, the kind of jetting off to Russia, being put into an induced coma, going out to Serbia, all of these things that uh, the journalists asked and said, look, you're, you're well known as kind of a scientific man. Why are you effectively choosing therapies which clearly don't have a scientific basis for etc and he he does he does answer those but the one thing like there's a lot of questions that I would love to ask him there are a lot of um yeah there, there are a lot of I think fair criticisms or questions that I would like to ask him and that I've kind of been holding back on because I wanted to ask them to him personally like I wanted to have the opportunity partly because he was he was in uh, such a bad way for a while and it felt sort of inappropriate. And one of them is the thing that you can hear uh, the journalist ask at some points, which is, you're giving all of these medical reasons, but surely there's more to it than that. Like that whole story arc of, of kind of exploding into, into the public eye, the sort of becoming this lightning rod for the culture war, and then this incredible arc of um, of then what happened to him over the last couple of years. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that for him, given his background in, in Jungian therapy, given his background in kind of story, I don't think that even he really can be thinking there's no deeper meaning that, than it was just a, an allergic reaction to this. And then obviously he had the illness of his wife but then it, it was it was just a series of, of medical events, which is what M Michaela jumps in to say, no, no, it was definitely all of this. It was just uh, we've got the bad, bad um, advice from the doctors, et cetera. Like there, there is more to that. There is more to that arc. There is more to that um, incredible strain that he was under and then the, the, the effect that it had on him that I, I would love to hear. I, my suspicion is that he's not at that point yet where he can really reflect on that. And I would, I would love to hear his reflection on that, that, that arc, what happened over the period of, of two years. Um, can I just and, chip in, David? Sorry? Can I just chip in for a second? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say this has always been a paradox with him. You know, from the very first time I met him, he was, I mean, the point is, and this is why, you know, it's difficult to judge because unless he's lying and one finds it hard to believe that he's lying, this is how Michaela was cured after a great deal of grief and suffering. Subsequently, it cured him of depression. Now, that doesn't mean that what he's subsequently used as a, as a as a strategy was a sensible one. But in the first two instances, you know, I'm quite inclined to believe that it was true. But this time, <laughs> it seems to be too, too bizarre to believe, I suppose. Yeah, there's one thing I'd like to pick up on there because, and this is, this is a question I think that I would love to ask. And I think it's a question that needs to be asked because he he did talk about the all-meat diet and how it got him off antidepressants. And for a long time, he was asked the question, are you on antidepressants? And he, and he said many times, no, I've come off the antidepressants. But throughout all of that time, he was on benzodiazepines. And I think that is 
not entirely truthful. It's at least a sin of omission because as far, I, I mean, I've, as far as I'm concerned, benzodiazepines, which are for, for anxiety, they're definitely like very strong mood altering drugs. If you're on those for that entire period, and I, I think it's true to say that we now know that he was on those during the Kathy Newman interview, he was on those from, I think, 2016 onwards. That, for me, like the distinction between antidepressants and benzodiazepines to manage anxiety and to manage mood is kind of a dis distinction without a difference. But he went out of his way to kind of try and claim that, or, or not try and claim, but to, to, to make clear that he was off the antidepressants. And I think, I think that is... Given his given his focus on truth, that for me is a little like it's some it's a question that I think needs up to be answered, and and another question that is an open question. I don't know know what I think about this. Is does does the arc of the last couple of years call into question his philosophy? And I I, I can see the argument that it does, and I can see the argument that it doesn't. But I think for me, it certainly shows up, and I've, I've thought this about Jordan for quite a long time, I think Jordan's philosophy is necessary but not sufficient. And this focus on the individual is necessary but not sufficient. And I think that the arc that we've seen shows up some of that insufficiency. And I, and I think it's a very open question as to whether and, and like I say, I haven't got a I haven't got a firm view on that, but I think it's a, a question worth exploring as to what what the, the the story of the last two years what that means for his his whole philosophy. I mean, I think the tragedy here is that after a tremendous amount of media coverage, most people won't have a clue what his philosophy is. You know, I mean, it's been so mischaracterized, so misrepresented, so trivialized that the, the, the depth and breadth of it, which anybody who's watched his early videos or read the Maps of Meaning, which is not an easy book to read, and I still haven't finished it, but, you know, the, 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 he, he's a remarkable mind. But you would not think so if you re you would just think, what would you think? I mean, you would just think he was a, 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 a sort of table thumping, all right, bogeyman, and he's nothing like that, you know. And and uh, 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 and he's got a very, very, very interesting understanding of the way the world is and the way people are. And I think it's a great tragedy that there aren't more writers who have taken the trouble to just simply, without, you know, without getting into the whole red herrings uh, uh, and straw men of his supposed, his supposed misogyny, his supposed transphobia, which is entirely inaccurate, as far as I can make out, um, and have a think about what he's, he's saying. You know, and if you, when you get into what he's saying, it's, it's very profound and very important. And that's why he's got 25 million people looking at his videos, because they're watching his videos. They're not reading the newspapers. And, they, and that's why the people who are reporting on him don't understand because they're not looking at his videos. They're not watching his lectures. They're just reading other newspapers, deciding who he is, and going in there with both fists flailing. And there's this huge gap between a busy journalist who just has to knock out another feature every week, and you and I, who will sit down and think, this bloke looks interesting. And, you know, as in my case, about three years ago, before he was um, became famous, watched pretty much everything he'd ever recorded, and you know, and was gripped and fascinated, and compelled by what he had to say. And I simply didn't think of it, and still don't, in any in any political way.
It's a, it's almost as if our, our our political mentality has become reduced to tram lines, in which, which, that we're impossible uh, to mix my metaphors. That we can't we can't think outside, you know. And and he doesn't sit anywhere in a simple spectrum of political thought, and people don't seem to be able to cope with that, or they can't be bothered to check him out properly. Because they're almost frightened that he might be right, and then, um, and then, of course, that is going to cause them problems, and they're going to have to start rethinking their whole world view, and nobody wants to do that. God knows. I mean, I do, but most people don't, you know. And and, um, and uh, it's a, it's a pity. It's a it's a terrible pity. Hmm. I think we can move on to the the Q and A. Portion, unless there's anything that you wanted to say that you haven't said already, Tim. Only that I've come out of this whole thing with with great sympathy for Jordan Peterson and with an increased disillusionment um, with journalism. Because the truth is, Decker Aiken had is not by any means one of the worst offenders in this general field. I mean, she's not somebody who would necessarily go out to nail anybody. You know, she's, she's, uh, she's more of a Lim Barber type figure than, than anything. She's not somebody, she's not Owen Jones going out to sort of nail somebody who doesn't politically agree with her, I don't think. Um, and it makes me sad you know, that someone who's, who's smart and a good writer should be, should, should lack that sort of integrity, I suppose. And it does, it makes me genuinely disappointed. And, you know, I wish, I just wish that there, there could be more quality control by the editors. Jochen, you were first with your hand up. Uh Hey, Tim, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, I have for a while now had a long running thought um, that our society has become very, very complex over the last, it, it has been going on for a long time, obviously, but really, especially in the last 70 years since World War II. Um, and one feature that is required for this to work is some amount of dampening of disagreeableness and move towards agreeableness, just so that all of these complex mechanisms don't always cr cr crunch with the, with the sand between the gears. And so all of that sand needs to go out so that the gears can really move very fluently. And that Jordan Peterson is certainly someone who, and I, I really wonder how much the benzodiazepines have contributed to this in, in the five years or like, like four years before he disappeared from view. Because especially in this interview that he posted online, he seemed so much more willing to give space to an argument or to a question that might be an attack rather than immediately jump on the opportunity to push back. And so I wonder if one of the reasons that a lot of people now have this strong preconceived notion of him as this alt-right whatever person is his very strong disagreeableness for a while and that... Uh, I, I would hope that with his the way that he now wrote his statement, if he is able to have a comeback on that tone, not so much that he will be vindicated by the people who have already stapled, like, like put a stamp on him saying he is this terrible person, but that a new almost generation of journalists who haven't been tainted yet have the ability to look at him really for his content and not just for the personality feature of being so angry or like so, so f fighting so much. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very good thought. And you are right, I'm sure. You know, the, I mean, to be fair to Jordan, he was thrown into this whole thing. And at times he could be very good humoured about it, but other times he could really snap back. And... I suppose, you know, he wouldn't disagree in some ways that that's something of a Christian point of view and, and a good one, I think. You know, it's just like, be gentle in what you're saying. 
you know, make your points, but let the conflict end with you, you know, and say, okay, well, that's what you think. And I think he's tried very hard to do that. He tries very hard to take other people's point of view. But, you know, to be fair on him, I think he was pushed beyond the limits of what most of us could cope with without saying, go fuck yourself. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, I, I sometimes, to be honest, his self control was extraordinary. You know, I mean, I, I, but I know what you're saying. You know, again, it, you could see it as a matter of PR, but, you know, how many of us could take that level of attack and not occasionally get pissed off? I mean, I'd last five minutes, you know, before I was throwing things. I mean, yeah. But thank you. No, it's a very good point. Yeah, there's always been that sort of inquiring nature I remember something in one of his Q and A's a while ago, where he mused on his reaction to some of the journalists. Kind of recognised that he was getting more and more tetchy, that he was getting more and more wound up and defensive. And to his credit, he he said he said something like that. That means that there must be some internal corruption in me. And it's sort of very biblical language. It's very t- kind of classically Peterson, and. That's that for me is that for me is what made him interesting. It's that sense of like even when he was lecturing, you had the sense that he he was exploring, like even though he kind of knew where like he knew the outlines of what he was saying, but there was never a deadness to his with so many academics, there's a kind of deadness to what they're saying. It's sort of like you know what they've said, they've said it so many times. Whereas, and we talk about inquiry, we talk about kind of emergent dialogue on this channel a lot, and there's that. Uh, for me, there was that quality of listening to him, especially in the Maps of Meaning lectures, that had that quality of inquiry, of of kind of asking questions rather than just telling you what he thought about something. And I I felt like he was losing that over the two years that he that he kind of increased in public profile and felt a little bit more repetitive and felt like there was less of that kind of exploration. And then like in his in his public statement the bit that i just read out just now there's that there, there is an inquiry there's a there's a sense of am i contributing to this has my ego already got the best of me like these questions and i really hope because i because i still as 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 does tim i think what he is holding is a really vital piece of the puzzle. It's the same piece of the puzzle that Jung was holding. It's the same piece of the puzzle that, um, that um, what's his name? Joseph Campbell was holding. And Matt, like that, that kind of deeper story of Western culture is certainly part of the solution, recovering that sense of kind of the, the sacredness of our history and all of that is part of the solution that we're moving towards. I think it's not the whole story. And I think that, and I think that he also, part of his, maybe part of his downfall, part of his, which maybe was being pointed towards in the article is, I think he did have a very combative attitude. Most of the time it was kind of about intellectual confrontation, combativeness, taking on all comers. And I think he was thinking in a kind of, um, yeah, in a, in a, in a sort of, yeah, combative way. And I wonder, yeah, I, I really hope that he continues his recovery and comes back in a in a way that is maintains that sense of exploration and maintains that sense of because uh, maintains that sense of potential curiosity, because then I think we might start to see more synthesis. And I think what we're desperately needing in the intellectual realm is that synthesis. And that's what I kind of had hoped for with the initial emergence of the intellectual dark web. Oh, wow, we might see a synthesis of like Jungian psychology and evolutionary theory and how they're just seeing different parts of the same. And for various reasons, which I'll talk about tomorrow a little bit in, our, in the IDW conversation, mainly to do with egotistical reasons, to do with kind of being public figures in this very public age and not wanting to engage with people who they disagreed with and getting fixated around all of the kind of psychological flaws that we all have, it didn't happen. 
And yet it needs to happen. And I think it could happen, but it's going to require an integration of the psychological level of the admission of vulnerability, of the admission of fragility, of the admission that we all get hung up around certain things, that we all get captured by our audience. We all start to say things that we know are going to get people's approval rather than what we actually think, or we we start kind of warping the information that comes in and only listen to the people who support us and ignore the criticism. And like all of those things are why I think we're we're stuck in the place that we are at the moment, which is for me a sense of a real lack of novelty and synthesis in the intellectual landscape. So hopefully coming back with that sense of curiosity and uh, dialogue and hopefully he can find people who will engage with him in good faith in the way that clearly the Times and Decker was was not able to. And and that that that's a hope. That's a hope. But I think that it, it would be very interesting if that was possible. I think uh, Fiverr S has just posted about how aggressive he would often be on his videos. Uh, mm -hmm. in the past and, and she's quite right of course and 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 he could be he, he talked about people being things being bloody stupid and that's a load of rubbish and you know and I, if I'm honest that attracted me when I started watching it I mean it appealed to sort of the aggressive male in me you know just going but at the same time you're also thinking no you're right it is a load of rubbish <laughs> you know and nobody ever says that you know so you were ve I was very attracted to his 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 certainty, his uh, his almost evangel evangelizing is that's a word. Um, I was attracted to it um, because it was um, because uh, because a lot because so many people hadn't been saying it, and so many people were scared to say it. But I think uh, David's right, and 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 um, you know I think that there's a uh, We've, we've, we've gone beyond that now, you know, and I'd really like to see him being a much more conciliatory figure and also trying to just more proactively distance himself from the alt-right, you know, which I never think he did quite enough work on because I don't think he is or ever has been a member of the alt-right, whatever that is. Um, but he didn't do much to disavow it. And uh, I think he might have worked a bit harder on that side of things. Um, but, you know, I liked his acerbity. But I think it, it may serve him better now to, to soften things down a bit. Hmm. But then I'm not so arrogant as to think I can give him advice. I think his, his motivation, because one of the things that I was always... I, he never criticised Trump very much, which for someone who makes truth such a centrepiece of his philosophy was was interesting. He talked about, well, I I don't have any other, I don't have any different views than Trump of Trump than most other people do, so why bother talking about it? But I think I think he empathised very strongly with a lot of the the young men who ended up supporting Trump. Like, I think he really identified with these are a lot, a lot of lost guys, like the people who are sort of the gamers who are kind of with the Pepe flag and stuff like that. And I think he said, no one gives a shit about these guys. I give a shit about these guys. And I'm not going. And I think he may have made a little bit of a kind of calculation, conscious or unconscious, not to not to attack Trump, because that would have led him to be less influential in the eyes of those of those people who were kind of basically supporting Trump as a kind of loser meme. The funny thing in, in 2016 was that it was kind of a gamer thing to support Trump because he was a loser. The whole Pepe flag, Pepe was a loser. That was the whole joke was that, can we get this, this guy as a walking meme? Can we get him into the White House? Because there's nothing else we, we've got interesting going on in our lives. And they managed it. And, and Peterson was tracking a lot of that. And I think he had a lot of empathy for these for these guys, these sort of lost guys. And I think he did sort of pull his punches on Trump. He did. Um, and I think, I think also 
as time went by, he was taken up more and more by people who I, I don't think, and I wonder if that was part of the arc, was he got taken up more and more, like he was, he ended up being, doing an interview with Victor Orban, who is the kind of quite authoritarian leader of Hungary. He was taken up by people who, on people on the right who I don't think have got a lot of integrity. And he was basically used by increasingly used as a weapon in the culture war. And I don't, I don't know what effect that might've had on him as a kind of a long-term thing. And I, I suspect that that might've been part of it. Uh, might've been part of the narrative is an increasing kind of discomfort with the use of what he was saying. And I think there was a kind of, from the start a kind of, I'm not going to say deal with the devil, but a kind of compromise in terms of the deeper level of like the meaning crisis and the, and the, the religious crisis and the spiritual crisis of the West, and then delving into the, the politics as well. And I think that was a difficult balancing act to, to pull off long term. Yeah, he might have done, he might have done better just just to have made a statement. I mean, it would have been hard given his critique of social justice philosophy, but he might have done wise to just steer away from formal politics altogether. You know, it, 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 the, what we think of as governmental politics. and I mean, he might have been quite well advised to just say, that's not something I'm interested in. You know, and, and stick to the idea of, you know, language and meaning. And not get hauled into the. But I, I, I thought it was bizarre him going to see Orban. I mean, that didn't sit well. Um, and he certainly made some perverse decisions. Um, but every time I sort of think he's being a dick, he kind of wins me over again somehow. Just in in a sense by his his vulnerability and his sincerity, I suppose. Five, you had a, a comment in the thread that a lot of people uh, liked. Would you like to say that to the call? Yeah, I don't know if I should open my mouth here. I'm really, I've got so much. I, I, you know, Jordan Peterson, I just don't think that he realizes how deeply he hurt some people. I mean, as I said in the chat, I recognize overreach and the outrage and I share that outrage about you know the culture wars etc but to go and to use the kind of language that he did just writing people off as being wrong I mean that doesn't seem very academic to me or empathic and the other thing that I had a problem with I was studying Jung when he was um when I was reading him and at first I thought, oh, this guy is so fantastic. And then I started reading it and I saw a lot of how he was kind of cherry picking the facts and drawing from Jung the parts that he, that fit his story to create a narrative and an argument. And that bothered me. I, um, I hope people will be generous with me. Um, because I have mm. some holes anyway. So I just want there. That's that's what's on my mind. Thank you. Well, I'm totally grateful for that contribution. You know, I mean, that's the sort of forum this should be. You know, and and, and I agree with you. You know, I mean, you can't go around calling people stupid and not expect any pushback. My only remark was, I think he always said that um, thinking was a form of fighting. Um, and, and one shouldn't expect to be able to walk away from any discussion, possibly not being hurt. You know, I mean, as he said in the uh, Kathy Newman interview, you know, he said, well, you're, you're hurting me and good for you because you're challenging my questions and, you know, and, and you're, you're, you're doing what you're meant to do. And that's what intellectual inquiry involves. But I, I take your point exactly. I mean, you can't really go around throwing rocks at people and not expecting to throw rocks back. 
I'm sure he did expect them to throw rocks back. Danny, did you want to read out your really long comment to the to us all? Uh, not particularly. I feel I feel like that was probably a bit inappropriate. There, I was thinking out loud, and, and I'm using an iPad on Zoom for the first time, and have absolutely no idea how it works. So, <laughs> I'm happy to listen and let anybody just kind of read it if they want to. It's but but I did think I do think what you've touched upon, David, in some of your recent films about how these figures and even yourselves at Rebel Wisdom are coping with the personality cultures around all of this stuff as well. And I think that's an interesting question, like how. How can these truth seekers also handle the information ecology, the way it's like the algorithms that that portray the way they are seen and they've had the way their fans see them and how much information they see. Um, uh, but I don't know how relevant it is to this particular conversation, but it sort of came up in my mind. Uh, yeah. Just as I was typing. So that that's, that's all I've got to add there. Yeah. I think it's very important and it's actually, so I listened to, Jordan's recent conversation with Douglas Murray. And what was interesting in that conversation was that they talked quite a lot. And Jordan said how shocked and concerned he was by the spread of misinformation. Effectively, he was talking about the breakdown of sense making. He was, he was saying how concerned he was about the spread of misinformation, about how polarized everything was online, about how and it was all of the topics that we've been covering here about the nature of the, the fracturing of the information ecology, the epistemic fracturing. And I think this affects everyone. I think this is, this is exactly what you're pointing at. It affects anyone who's got a public profile, affects any of us who, who are active online. It's very difficult to, to sift through and to get a valid um, understanding of what is real. And that's to do with our like that's to do with who we are that's to do with kind of the feedback of our, about our own behavior and about our own character and it's also about making sense of the world out there and how to kind of weigh up different information and like it's it's a it's a huge problem and it was really interesting that that was something that I took from that conversation that Jordan and Douglas were both kind of reflecting on and feeling was was becoming an existential problem, especially during the pandemic. I think we're, we're coming to the end of 90 minutes. I'd like to thank Tim for making the time. And Tim, is there anything that you wanted to say before we close? Um, you know, I just hope people will keep thinking critically and honestly and, and 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 not join any tribe and not sign up for any side and you know make sense in in, in as independent and, and as fair a way as they can without succumbing to the inevitable or the seductive idea of just joining some particular crowd or team. You know, I, I passionately believe in people making up their own minds. And I, and I think without that, we're lost. So that's that. Rebel Wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films. It's also about how we bring them into our lives, which is why over the last few months, we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community, our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q and A's with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel, and our wisdom gym with some of the biggest names in growth and transformation. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching.